I'm so excited you're here and not sleeping. <laughs> I think I missed all of the New Year. I think I was asleep at 10. I was such a party pooper. Uh, but so grateful that we get to be with you today and to usher in uh, this new year together. And I want to uh, welcome those who are watching online, watching, and um, maybe even this evening you're coming home and you're putting this on. So grateful that we can be in your home and that we can um, hear from God together. So let's get ready to hear what God is going to do today, because I believe that every time we open the Word of God, God is speaking, and there's something that we can get out of it that brings change to our life. I believe every single one of us want change. Not one of us is like, hey, yeah, everything's great in my life. There's always something that we want to change or to be better. And that's why we prepare ourselves to receive the word, because every time we hear the word, is an opportunity for change. So say with me, today, I will hear the voice of God through the word of God. My eyes will be enlightened. I will be changed. Now turn to your neighbor and say, I will be changed. Turn to your neighbor that's really far away and say, we'll be changed. You guys got married. Woohoo! It's going to be a great year. A little rough, your first, but it's going to be a great year. <laughs> All right. So um, this past week, we, I spent a few days in Orlando with my, I have two brothers that live up in Orlando, and we have a tradition um, for those of you who are uh, new or visiting today uh, and don't know, I am full-blooded Italian. And we have a few of those Italian traditions. We've not kept a lot of them because we got so busy with church. But usually uh, during the holiday, we make homemade pasta. And my mom purchases this specific flour. It's really good for you. I don't think it has any calories in it. Um, and so she makes homemade sauce and, and stuff. And, you know, we all help. We, she didn't do it by herself. We all work together. And so we're in the kitchen, and, and we're doing the dough and putting it through the machine and throwing flour. And I wasn't even hungry when we got started. But let me tell you, halfway through, I started to get so hungry. Because I absolutely, it is my favorite food. My mother's homemade pasta with her sauce and her sausage. There's nothing like mom, right? So, and, and, and then after I, and listen, I sinned. I sinned so bad. I had two huge plates. I mean, I was full before the first time. And the first plate, I was full. But sec, no, second time, I had to have some more. You know, because we never eat it. You know, it's, it's a rarity that we actually do that these days. And so I was just so full. But let me tell you, I was so satisfied. Did you ever meet a meal or ever eat a meal and you're like, just, I'm just so satisfied? Anybody here? And then there are times that you eat the wrong thing. Like maybe you're in a hurry and maybe you grab some chips or you grab chocolate cake or you grab, you know, you just grab something. And, you, and if initially you're like a little satisfied, but then what happens? Just about an hour later, you're like, oh, that was wrong. You're no longer satisfied, correct? Why am I saying all of this? I believe that many times we allow things in the world to satisfy us instead of God. And I believe that we settle. We settle for cravings around us. We're in a hurry, just whatever, because we do have, we, we want to be satisfied. There's something in us that wants to be satisfied that we just, we're just grabbing and going. And really, the only one thing that can really, 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 really satisfy us is God. Only God. It's a satisfaction that it's complete, it's whole, it's good, and yet so many times we're distracted away from being satisfied with God alone. There's a scripture that I want to read to you, and Jesus said this, it's a part of the, the, the Beatitudes. Um, now, so Jesus is saying this to a group of people, so let's just say that Jesus is saying this to us today. And he says, blessed, that means happy, fortunate, super, super blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, God's ways, God's character, who he is, for they shall be filled. That word is interesting. That word filled literally means satisfied. Like there's not one thing that you even need anymore. A complete satisfaction. It's like a, a place of peace that you can't even describe. 
So there's a, there's a clue here that somehow when we hunger and we thirst after God, his ways, his, his attributes, his character, somehow it equates to this deep satisfaction, contentment, and confidence that you cannot get from any other food, any other cravings that the world has to offer. And I think that, I think that sometimes we, we, we do, we, we know that, but we kind of know that, but we allow different things. How many of you can say that I get, you get distracted by things every now and then? I mean, come on. Just every now and then you just get distracted by things. Squirrel, 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 right? Every time, I mean, it's really fun to watch you guys. Like, a door can open and you're all, it's just a door, right? Or a baby or something. You know, we're so easily distracted. And if we keep to that distraction, we actually allow that distraction to fill us instead of what God wants to fill us with. So what is our hope? Like, why, why, why am I teaching this message? Why did God put this on my heart? Because I believe that God wants to stir in us this fresh, fresh hunger for him. Because he's really the only one that can satisfy you. I think that some of us, uh, we could look at 2016, and we can say, man, there's parts of 2016 I want to act like they never happened. Some of you have experienced some tragedy. There's been some hopelessness. Things that you're not really happy about that have happened. And then there's some good things that happened in 2016. I believe that if we don't change our hunger... We're going to get the same results that we had in 2016 and 2017. Things can be different. Things can change, but they won't happen on its own. And I think it's appropriate that we're going in this direction in January, because I think in January, we begin to look back at the year and, and, and you know, you think you started off right. How many of you can say, you know, I, I got the gym membership, I started to work out, and I started to pray, and then I stopped working out, and I started to eat right, and then I stopped eating right, and I started to be kind, and then I got ugly, right? You started off right. I was really nice to my husband, now I'm mean, right? You started off right. And I think that the, it's just patterns that we walk in that we need to, we need to like, you want to like press restart, Anybody? I need a fresh start. I need some, how about this? I need some restoration. There's things that were stolen from me. There's things that escaped me. Mm, I need some restoration. And I want to share with you a scripture. It's, it's, um, it's based on the people of Israel. You know, the, the word of God is just filled with people like you and I. So we can study their life and find ourselves in it. And so, like you and I, they were walking with God, and as they were walking with God, they were experiencing tremendous things, but they got distracted. They started looking at the surrounding nations and seeing what they were doing, and they got distracted and entertained and didn't even realize that they were kind of getting off track. Then they found themselves in a place that they didn't want to be in. How did I get here? Did you ever ask yourself, how did this happen? And you don't want your spouse to tell you, because they will, right? Well, let me tell you, I don't need, I just need you to hug me, not tell me, right? So they're, they're, they're there now. They realize this is not supposed to be. I'm not supposed to be living like this. There's more. And so the Bible says that they actually cried out to God. In fact, this, in this particular time period, they'd gone through a tremendous famine. And so there's this picture prior to these verses where you've got these priests that are standing before the entrance to the holy places where the presence of God is, and they're interceding. And then God responds at this turning back to him, going back to him. They recognize we're off. I need to be restored. I need to be refreshed. I need to get back on track. And this is what it says. In, Luke, in Joel chapter 21, verses through 21 through 27, it says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid. You beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up. Now, that was like, what? There was a famine. There was devastation. And now God is saying, oh, no, there's going to be open pastures. They're going to be springing up. Can you imagine the hope that was coming into their hearts? And the trees bear its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. So you're seeing like new growth. You're seeing restoration. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice 
in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So it's this picture of, yes, there's been no rain. You got off. You need some restoration. I'm just going to rain my presence, my blessing. I'm going to rain it on you. And out of it, there's going to be this new growth and this restoration. And he goes on to say, uh, the threshing floors shall be full of wheat. It looks, it's abundance, there's supply, there's food. And the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will, what does that say? That's the nature of God. He's a restorer. And I think that some of us could say, I need some things restored this year. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. The crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the crawling lo chewing locusts. So historically, when the locusts would come in, they would, they'd be so thick you couldn't see your hand in front of you. And when they would leave, there was complete devastation. There's no way you could see the land refreshed after they got done with what they got done with. But yet God is promising, I'm going to reign, I'm going to restore. And that's the God that we serve. He's a good God. He's a restoring God. But that restoration for the people of Israel, it came out of them seeking God, coming back to God. So what I want to talk to you about today is three things that lead to three things. And you have in your worship guide notes, you've got um, notes that you can pull out and you can follow along. I'm just going to say this is probably one of the most critical messages that you will hear. It's very simple. But if you put to practice what we're going to give you today, 2018, you will say to me, and I can promise, I can guarantee it, you will say to me, my life has completely changed. And I'm not saying one area. I'm saying every area. Every area. You know, I, sh I, shared, with this, I shared this in the first service that as a parent, you know, I, I watch my kids grow. And, and I think some of you parents experience this too, that if you could, like, you, you know, you live their life basically, right? And if you could, I know, I, I feel this. If I could, I would go in my kids' lives, in their bodies, and live their lives for them. I would. You, you'd want to do that too, right? Because, you know, you see the, the, the choices that they're making or how their thought processes are. Just let me go in your body. Let me do this for you. I, 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 you won't, you'll avoid so much. Anybody feel that way every now and then? And, you know, you can't. It's impossible. I've tried it. It didn't work. You know. And, and it's interesting that I find myself now in this, I, I just absolutely, I'm so grateful that I have an opportunity to pastor here. So grateful that I get to be a part of your lives. But the way that I feel with my kids, that I understand there's just certain truths about God that I so desperately, I mean desperately want formed in you because I know what it will do for you. I hunger for it. I pray for it. One of the scriptures that I pray over you, that Christ would be formed in you. My desire is that you'd be so distracted with what God is doing in your life that the distractions of the world would pale, would just pale, because God has so much that he wants to do in your life. So the things I'm going to share with you really is things that if, if you put them to practice, you, you make a commitment to it, guaranteed I can sign my name, your life will be changed. You will have a conversation, even within three months, it'll be changed. But in 2018, you'll say, I'm not the same person. My family's not the same person. My finances have changed as a result of what I'm going to teach today. So you're going to want to keep this on your refrigerator to remind yourself. Does that sound good? Three things that will lead to a personal revival. Three things that will lead to personal revival. Now, revival seems to, it, it simply means to be restored, to be reinvigorated, to be strengthened. How many of you can use a little bit of strength? How many of you can use some reinvigoration? The rest of you are liars. So, <laughs> some of you are like, I had a really late night, Pastor Tracy. I can't believe I'm here, right? So grateful that you're here. So, the first thing is this real simple seek. Seek. We need to seek 
his word, and his presence. Real simple. Now, if you could picture Jesus, he's having, he's having a meeting like this, and there's a bunch of people in this meeting, and he's looking out at this group of people who are so burdened with life. Have you ever seen somebody who's really burdened with life? I mean, they're wearing it on their face. Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, they're wearing their life on their face? Maybe the stress of their finances, the stress of maybe there's marital discord. Kids are, are driving them crazy. There's some kind of an addiction, and they're wearing it on their face. And this is what Jesus, Jesus is looking out to this group of people who have the cares of the world weighing them down. And this is what he says to them in Matthew 6, 33. Looking right at him, he said, Seek first the kingdom of God, the domain of God, the things that pertain to God, the character of God, the ways of God, what's happening in the spiritual realm. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his character, his ways, and all these things, these needs will be added to you. But this is what we do. We go after our needs. We pursue our needs versus pursuing him. And I have found that when I go after my needs, they never get met. But when I pursue him, they seem to get met. Because it's a principle in seeking him first, everything gets taken care of. Why? When we seek him, we begin to Find ourselves in him. We begin to find, wait a second, why am I so bothered by this when he already took care of it on the cross? Wait a second, why am I so burdened with this need when he said he'll supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory? Wait, why am I bothered by this when he said, you see what I'm talking about? When we seek him, we begin to unravel the resources, what he wants for us, what he desires for us, we begin to cooperate with supernatural realities. Seeking him first, not second, not third, but first. And, and years ago, I had a vision from the Lord. I was, I think, 16 and a half, almost 17 years old, and it was so real. And it was a dart board, and I'm not good at darts. In fact, you don't want to be around me when I'm playing darts. And, but you know how the center of, the, of those dart boards, there's like a bullseye. Then there's rings. Can you see those rings? Some say 5, 10, 20, as they're going out and in. And the Lord said to me, Tracy, I'm giving you a choice. You could either seek me, pursue me, learn who I am, because in learning me, you'll find you. You can seek me. And all of these rings, and he shared, he shared with me that every single ring represented an area of my life, seasons of my life. Marriage, occupation, children, just what my life would entail. And he said, if you seek me first, all of these rings, I'll take care of. But if you seek the rings, you're on your own. <laughs> I didn't want to be on my own <laughs> when I knew he, he had so much to offer me, so much to offer. And I began at a very young age in my teens. The things that I'm sharing with you, I began in my teens. I look at some of these teenagers here. Oh, if you'll start with the things that I'm teaching today. No telling what God will do with your life. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and if you look at in the word of God, there are patterns. You'll find patterns. And without a shadow of a doubt, when a people or a nation or an individual, any of that, would consistently set their minds to seek God, you'll see the pattern. They prospered. In every area, there was less war. There was peace. There was wisdom. There were ideas. Innovation it was always a result of prayer. Why? What's the big deal about prayer? And, and again, I don't know why God set it up this way, but he did. God set up our lives, the kingdom of God. He set this whole thing up that he will not work independent of us. He works in cooperation with us. We have been taught through religion that God just does whatever he wants to do. That's not true. He gave us a free will, and the Bible says how he put man as an authority in the earth. That, this is how we set it up. So he doesn't move unless we cooperate with him. I know it's pretty crazy, isn't it? 
And that really freaked me out when I finally got a hold of that. You're waiting on me? You want to cooperate with me? He does. Even with all of our imperfections, even with all of our mess-ups, he wants to cooperate with you and I. And he cooperates through prayer. We actually release God's ways, God's resources in the earth. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Jesus, he said, talking to his disciples when he was teaching them about prayer, because they were like, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray, because when you pray, things happen. When we pray, nothing happens. So what are you doing, Jesus? And Jesus said, when you pray, this is how you need to pray. You pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What was he saying? You need to release heaven's realities in your earth situations. You and I have the potential to release heaven's resources in our earth situations, heaven's resources in our marriage, in our workplace, within our children, in our homes. He's made it available. Oh, but you're not going to hear that in every pulpit of America. I remember when I began to hear these things. I was very sick and I was very poor. <laughs> not, a good, not a good situation. And things began to change. And I began to realize God had more for me. So prayer is an invitation, guys, to cooperate with God, to see literally the course of history altered for his will. It's an invitation. How many will take it? And I think the reason why a lot of people don't pray, they don't see a benefit in it. Isn't that true? Oh, come on. Don't look at me like you're so spiritual. Why is it hard to pray? Because we, we don't always see an immediate benefit to it. And we'll say, because maybe in our minds they didn't get answered, so we say, oh, prayer doesn't work. You've said it. Maybe you didn't say it with your mouth, but you said it up here. One time or another, it doesn't work. Because maybe it just didn't turn out the way that you thought it needed to turn out. But that's what God has chosen, prayer, to see his kingdom ways on the earth. So, Seek. What are we seeking? How do you seek God? Like, do I just show up in a room and mutter some things? Seeking God simply means you seek his word and you seek his presence. You seek his word. Why? His word is his character. It's his will. It's what he's made available for you. So without seeking his word, you can't know God. You won't know who you are. The more you know him, the more you find out who you are. Because you're made in his image. You're his kid. It's amazing. We can see with our kids that the, that the older they get, they do things like us. Isn't that true? Some things I like, some things I don't like, right? Don't do that. That's, that's No, don't do that, right? But they, they become more and more like us. So it's the same thing. The more that we seek him, the more we become like him, the more we experience that comfort, that peace that we're all looking for. So look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It's a familiar scripture, so don't tune out just because you've heard it before. Sometimes we have to hear something over and over and again before we actually get it. It's amazing. Sometimes people will say to me, oh my gosh, I never heard that before. I said, I said that last week. You know, we're just in different places and different places of receiving, right? So it says, do not be conformed to this world. Now that gets me. He doesn't just say something to say something. By default, if, if we don't do something different, we're going to be conformed by the world. Because you're in it. All the different, different stimuli that we, we receive every single day, driving in our car, going to malls, watching movies, the conversations, workplaces, there's all kinds of things that are anti-God around us we don't even realize. And they're influencing, they're influencing, and they're trying to conform us. So, so don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. That word transformed in the Greek is metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. So I want you to see this invitation even in the scripture. Now we know that in, we, we learned in our science classes that a caterpillar crawls. They're close to the ground or they're on a branch, but they're crawling close to the ground, probably eating a lot of dirt, probably crawling over some poop every now and then. Crawl, crawl, crawl. But then it goes into this change where it literally is no longer resembling what it was. It's something completely different, and it's no longer crawling. It's flying. There's no more poop in its mouth. 
I'm saying that for a reason, because so many times we're settling for crawling instead of flying. We were meant to fly. We were meant to soar over situations, not let them weigh us down, but we let them weigh us down because of this one thing, this renewing of the mind. Whatever you're thinking, whatever's going on in here, you are living out. That's why he said renew your mind. It doesn't say renew your spirit, does it? No, because your spirit, when you receive Jesus, your spirit is literally born anew. It's completely like God. It requires no change. But your mind, will, and emotions, that's your soul, that's what requires the change. And once that changes, and this is the goal, this is the goal of the soul to be more and more like your spirit that's like God. And the only way that that soul, the mind, will, and emotions are literally transformed is by the renewing of your mind with the word of God. That's the only way. And so I want to do this little example. So we come to God and we don't even realize it, that we're full of stuff from the world. There's fear and rejection and bitterness and anger, a lot of rejection in here. And we've got all these walls that we've put up to protect ourselves. And we've learned to process through this. We process life through all the pain, the hurt, the negative, the fear. We're processing life. So we're not going very far. And this is the invitation that God gives us. He says, renew your mind. So as you pour the word of God, the word is often referred to as water, the washing of water by the word. As you begin to daily, consistently, daily, consistently pour that word into your mind, what begins to happen? All of that ucky, gross stuff, it just gets literally pushed out in what's left. It's clear. Oh, man, I can see. I can see I'm not being deceived. I'm not listening to that lie anymore. I can love. I can soar. I can take risks. It's a whole other way to live. But we settle for the junk. And I want to encourage you. You don't have to settle for the junk. Your mind can be renewed. And and like I said before, I wish I could come into your homes in the morning and wake you up and take you to the kitchen table with a cup of coffee and help you. And there's a reason why I'm saying that. Because what, what actually got me interested in the Word is I saw my mom, she would get into the Word, and I saw so many changes happening in her life I was like, okay, she goes into the Word and she changes. So I'm going to go into the Word and I'm going to change. And I also, I went to a church like this. I heard these truths and I said, okay, I'm going to do what I've just heard. Now, I'm going to be really honest with you. And I think you're going to be honest with me. When I started to read the Word of God, and it was the King James Version. I shouldn't have started with that, but I did. When I started to read the Word, I was bored. Can I have some honest people here? You were a little bored when you first started reading the Word? <laughs> Love your honesty. Or how about this? What are you saying? Right? Especially if you start in the Old Testament, don't start in the Old Testament. If you've never read the Word of God, do not start in the Old Testament. I had question mark. Oh, I have pages on my first Bible. Why? 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 Literally, question marks. So, so, but I remember I just stayed with it, though. I stayed with it. I stayed with it. And then I started reading it with other people. Because, um, and, and then I remember the day, the day when I actually was like, oh, you just spoke to me right out of the word. And I, cause I started to have paper next to me. And as I would read, I would just write whatever was coming to me. And I realized then that my ear was not accustomed to his language. It's kind of like going to a foreign country. If you don't know the language, you really can't get around, can you? You need an interpreter. You need someone to help you because you're not knowing the language. But once you know the language, now everything's beautiful. Everything makes sense. You've got direction. And so it takes some time for our ear to kind of get used to his language. So if you stay consistent with it, you'll learn his language. You'll start hearing his voice. And he promised that he'll lead and guide you and I in truth. It means you'll, you'll have less of those opportunities to be deceived. Less of this opportunity to be fooled and taken advantage of because he'll lead you and guide you in truth.
So the first thing is his word. We have to be committed in 2017 to seek his word. In, in John, it says that the word and God are one. You cannot know God. You cannot trust God. You cannot put your anchor in God without being in his word. When people say to me, well, I'm believing God. I trust God. I'll say, so what's your promise that you're trusting God for? Well, I don't know. Then you're not trusting God. You can't trust God without having a scripture, a word, a promise that he said is for you. It's a false emotion. <laughs> then eventually it'll get tested and you realize you don't have it. You don't have faith. It can only come. Trust can only come by the word. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. So 2017, it's got to be a commitment to his word. And then his presence, his presence. A familiar scripture, it's in Mark chapter 9, verses nine, uh, 2 through 3. This is, it's called the transfiguration. It's when Jesus, he went up on this mountain, he took Peter, James, and John with him. And the Bible says he was transfigured before him. Let's read about it. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up, led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Can you imagine Peter, James, and John? Ah! I really believe they pooped their pants. <laughs> now, this is what's interesting about this scripture. That word transfigured is the same word as transformed, metamorpho. Something happened, was changed in that presence. Something changes when we're in the presence of God. Why is worship so important? Like, why do we have, like, worship before the message? Is it just, you know, for those latecomers? Is it just, you know, to hear a great, some great music and, 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 and see people sing and play their instruments? No! Because worship invites the presence of God. And the presence of God, in that presence, there's change. It's the word and his presence that bring this change. It's that place, and I still, I don't get it. I can get up in the morning. I can have the cares of the world on my mind. Have you ever gone to bed? Like you kind of cast your cares. You kind of put things away. And then the minute you wake up, it's right there. You're like, I want to go back to sleep because it felt so good not to think about that. Anybody been there? I have some honest people here. So all of a sudden, my husband will put that, that his, his our, what is that thing called? Boom thing. Bluetooth speaker. He's the technical person. He'll put the music on and we'll start to worship God. And we have some CDs here if you, if you want to grab one, that, some of the ones that we use. And all of a sudden, all of that weight, all of that care, I don't know what I'm going to do. All of a sudden, something changes where now there's courage, now there's strength, now there's perception, now there's clarity, now there's wisdom. I don't know how it happens, but I found it in the Word, metamorpho. There's a transformation, there's a change that happens in the presence of God. So for me, I don't want to miss out. So I don't have to go pray put my little check mark, I did my prayer time. No, I get to, because I don't want to miss out. There's too much that I want to do today, and I don't want to do it in my strength, and my limited wisdom. I want more, and I go into the presence. Something happens to me, and I'm equipped for whatever it is that I have to face. I have been healed literally as I've been worshiping, literally healed physically as I was worshiping. There's something so powerful about it. It doesn't make sense. Not, really, the kingdom of God doesn't always make sense. Spiritual realities, they're spiritually appraised. It's his presence. It's his word. So you seek both. You can't have one without the other. You need both if we're going to experience true transformation. And so this is the goal. I want to, I want to, I want to show you this. Another great scripture. This is the goal. Why are we seeking him? Why are we in his word? Why are we in his presence? Why? Look at this scripture in 2 Corinthians 3.18. 
It says, so all of us who have had the veil removed, what that's talking about when a person comes to the knowledge that they need a Savior and they receive Jesus, it's like this veil is removed. Oh, my God. My God, he's my Savior. He's my Lord. He loves me. So when, when all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. Who is he talking about? You can reflect the glory of the Lord. I remember the first time I read that, I went, me? But I, I, I'm not good enough. Anybody felt that once or twice? No, you're not. That's why Jesus made you good enough, by putting his spirit in you. It's not about you trying to be good enough. He made you good enough by making you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The goal is to reflect his glory. Look at the rest of this. Uh, you can see, reflect the glory of the Lord and the Lord who is the Spirit, the Lord who is the Spirit, that's what comes to live on the inside of us, makes us more and more like who? Makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. That's the goal, folks. To be more and more like him. That means I'm less insecure. I'm less fearful. I'm less critical. I'm nice. I'm full of peace. I'm full of courage. More and more like him. That's the goal. What? I can be more and more like him? That's what it said. I didn't write that. That's in the Bible. That's what he has for you and I. Why? Does he not call you and I children of God? Does he not say that we're made in his image? But so many times, friends, we're pursuing other images besides the one that we were called to be. We're hungering after things that will not satisfy and not allowing the image of God to be grown and reflected through us. That's the goal right there. 1 John four seventeen says, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we. I said in the very beginning, the more I find out who he, who he is, the more I find out who I am. So many of you, I hear you often, I, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. I, I don't know why I'm on this earth. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You can know. You can know. The more you seek him, the more you will find you. Why you're alive. Why you've got breath in your body. So we're, we are made in his image. We find that out through seeking his word and his presence. So the first thing is to seek. The second thing is this, surround, surround. Surround yourself with people who are going in the same direction. Surround yourselves with people going in the same direction. There's countless, countless scriptures that say that iron sharpens iron. Tell me who you go with, I'll tell you who you become. Tell me who your friends are, I'll tell you what your life will be. So, you know, here at Life Christian Church, you'll, you'll hear us say, we are not a church of small groups. We're a small group church. Why are we a small group church? Because the way that that, that early church, in fact, historians cannot figure out how the early church grew the way that it did. They cannot understand how it became this force, but there are some clues. And let's look at this one scripture right here in Acts chapter 2, verse 46. It says, they worshiped together at the temple. They worshiped where? How? Together. Not just by me, myself, by myself. I'm not going to let anybody in. I can't let you in. If you find out what's, what's going on in my life, you may not like me. No, 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 no. I have to keep you at arm's distance. I've been hurt by too many people. No, 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 you can't come in. I'm going to have my walk by, with God by myself. And I'm saying, oh, that's a lie. Lie, 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 lie. You won't go anywhere that way. And that's where the enemy wants you, in circles, going nowhere. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper. That's communion. And they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. These were a people who did life together. They didn't just come to church on a Sunday, and I'll see you next week. No, they were vitally involved in each other's lives. They did life together. They worshiped together. They ate together. They laughed together. They let people in. 
You think your restoration is going to be by yourself. That's another lie. Did you notice that you're a body part? You're not a body. You're a body part. You're vitally connected to other people. That's how God made you. And until you get this thing that you need to be connected to other people, you don't know when your day is going to come that you're going to need someone to pray for you, someone to walk with you. I can't tell you what a blessing it is when I'll get a call or a text from someone within my group, and they'll say, I've just been praying for you for the last few days. And I'm like, you have no idea. But they're connected to God and they're connected to me, and they prayed for me. And boy, did I need it. Boy, did I need it. There are times you're not going to have strength to pray for yourself. You're not going to have the clarity to make a decision because there's so much going on in your brain. You're going to need someone to walk alongside you. I love our small group seasons. I just love to see the change in people. They, They enter in one way. They leave different every single time because that's how God created us to be in community, to be dependent, interdependent on one another, not to be isolated. And the enemy wants people isolated because when you're isolated, he can eat you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But when you're connected, mm, you got to go through me before you get to her. It's awesome. The body of Christ, it's a beautiful thing. My small group would be really my, what I'm connected to is our staff. We're friends and we fellowship and we'll, we'll be together in our staff meetings, which really is just, it's, to me, I call it a love fest because we, we encourage each other and we, we talk about the service, things that we can do better. But I can't tell you how many times somebody will say something that, oh, I needed to hear that. I'll often say, Evan, he's got these one-liners that just blow me away. I'll say, Evan, that's going to be in a sermon. That was awesome. Just, I get so encouraged I'm saying we all need that. So we have to seek God on our own. Yes, in his word, in his presence, but we need to surround ourselves with people. We cannot be deficient in 2017 of being connected to people. We need people. And you'll find your affinity group. But seek them out. Be intentional about it. It's not going to happen on its own. You think you're just going to walk into it? No, you're going to have to be intentional, recognizing how you're made and that this is something that you need. The next one is this, say, say, say what God says. Say what God says, not what your situation is telling you. This is going to be a year where you're going to talk the answer, not the problem. Talking about the problem won't change the problem. But when you say what God says about your issue, it then changes. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And that's why this is going to be a year where we learn more and more how to meditate his word. Let's look at Psalm chapter 1. Meditate simply means to mutter back to yourself the word of God. Mutter it back to yourself. We often, when we hear meditation, we get pictures from the world. And of course, the enemy likes to always copy what God does. And a lot of times when I think of meditation, I think of a person in some kind of a position and hum, you know, according to the scripture, to meditate means to mutter back to yourself, think and ponder the word of God. What's the big deal? It's another way of transforming your thoughts. But look what this says. This is so awesome. How many of you want to prosper in every area of your life? Really? Raise your hand. If you can prosper in every area of your life, in your relationships, in your job, in which college do I go to? If you could prosper in every area of your life, would you want that? If you don't, there's something definitely wrong with you. And there's a key here. There's a key here. There's a key here. Blessed is the one who does not, blessed means fortunate, so well off, so mm, blessed. Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. That's a bunch of negativity right there. Think about the people in your life. How much time are you spending with them? Do they pull you down? They pull you up. But whose delight, whose hunger, whose craving is in the word of the Lord. Look at this. And who meditates, mutters back to himself the word of God on 
on his word day and night. Now, when I read that the first time, I, I literally thought, oh my gosh, I can't do that. Because in my mind, I thought I had to be in some room somewhere all day and be literally speaking the word of God and not have a life. Said, That's just impossible. Then I realized, no, it's usually, it's just something that you've read that day or promise that the Lord prompts up in your spirit that you say throughout the day. And I'll, I'll show you an example in a second. That person, what person? Who's the that person? Who's that person? The one who meditates. That person, the one who meditates. The one who's taking the scripture, a promise, and saying it back to themselves. You may look a little foolish if someone looked in your window. The person who meditates. That person is like a tree. Planted by the streams of water. Can you see that tree? It's by the water. What's happening to a tree that's by the water all the time? It's constantly being watered, constantly being protected, constant. Mm -mm -mm, this is so delicious. Planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. There's no drying up. Whatever they do prospers. Whatever they do. Whatever they do. Whatever they do. You want to prosper in every area of your life? Right here. Meditate. And, and I, I, I didn't do this when I did my little example. Do you know that when you stop pouring that word, when you stop meditating the word, stuff be, you know, if, if, if I stopped pouring any water, I left that water there, it would eventually evaporate, dry, nothing's working. This is about, this, it's this continual process. It's this daily consistency. I can't go a day without eating. I don't know about you. I get hangry when I don't eat. You do too, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. We have to daily eat to, 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 to stay sustained. It's the same thing spiritually. It's a daily thing, guys. If not, it evaporates and we become ugly and mean and no faith and all selfish again and shriveled up. Meditate. So look at this, look at this scripture. Look at how fun this would be if throughout the day, Instead of meditating on what's not working in your life, oh my gosh, this hasn't happened. Oh my gosh, I still have to do this. Oh my God. Y'all do that, don't you? I have gotten off the wrong exit meditating on stupid stuff. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Look at it says, let them say continually. You can. You can say continually, oh, the Lord is magnified. He has pleasure in me. I'm his servant. I'm his child. I'm not a servant alone. I'm his child. Oh, let the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of me. You say that a few times, you're going to start seeing yourself prosperous. You're going to start having the, that wisdom that you need to get out of that situation. What you say really matters. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so many times we're just, we're saying what we've been feeding this. So if you feed yourself the word, you're going to find yourself saying the word. And you may say, you know something? I don't know how to do that. That's kind of new for me. And that's why it, we don't have it available this week. But there is a little booklet. It's called God's Creative Power. We have it in Spanish as well. It's scriptures put to a prayer form on wisdom, overcoming fear, on healing, on your authority. If you don't know how to start, start with this. This is what I started with at 16 and a half years old started saying these scriptures, and I found myself muttering them back to myself. And then when I would get into a situation, you know what would come up? That. That would just come right out of my mouth. Because I put it in. You put it in. You put it in. You make that investment. You make the investment. Then in the day of trouble, you can pull the withdrawal right out of your spirit. We have to say what God says. All right. So the choice is, are we going to call it what it is? Or are we going to call it what God says? So I have a challenge for you. This is the challenge. This is 2017. 
I guarantee you, you will not have different results doing the same things that you've done in 2016. You're not. I want to challenge you, if you truly want to see your life completely changed at the end of 2017, this is your challenge. I call it 2020 Did you notice that, that Jesus, one of his toughest moments, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows he has to go to the cross. The Bible says he was sweating blood. His disciples were off in a corner sleeping. And he went to them and he said, could you not pray for an hour? Now tell me, was that prayer for his benefit or theirs? It's for their benefit. That got me many, many years ago. What do I fill my life with? So much time is filled with things that really don't amount to anything. So this is the challenge that in 2017, every day, consistently, you'll give 20 minutes of being in the Word. We have what is called SOAP here. You can find it online. It's our SOAP guide. It's a reading plan on how to do it. It's online. You can go there and figure that out. 20 minutes of being in the Word. Don't start in the Old Testament. Start in the New Testament. Start with the book of John. Start with Ephesians, Colossians. Don't start in the Old Testament. You'll get confused unless you're in a small group. And um, 20 minutes in the Word. 20 minutes in worship. Some of you, man, you're just still uncomfortable in the presence of God. You don't know what to do. God wants to bring some freedom to you. God wants to do some healing. I have found such healing that I need. There were areas of my soul that I didn't even know needed healing. My whole process, people have often said to me, how did you heal? I lost my husband in 2002. He was the love of my life. I didn't know where he started and I started. We, that's how one we were. Worship was a big part of my healing. Every day, I'd go into the presence of God and somehow, supernaturally, what a man cannot do, what a counselor cannot do, God went in and healed me in a way that I, I cannot put to words. I, I don't know how to put it to words. He healed my soul. He gave me a future and a hope that pinched me. I love my life. Pinch me. He healed me so deeply. Worship. I cannot live without it. The minute I hear it, I'm there. I'm there because I can't live without it. I'm like a fish without water. I need your presence. I'm desperate for your presence. It makes me, it shades me. I find myself in you in worship. I'm challenging you. If you're afraid of it, run to it. 20 minutes of the word, 20 minutes of worship. Get a CD at our bookstore. Go online, YouTube. There's so much great music. Jesus Culture, Hillsong, Bethel Worship. I mean, it's all out there. Great stuff. Commit 20 minutes of worship. And then 20 minutes of just speaking the word of God, declaring the word, praying. On our site, we have our prayer resource site. There's so many tools to help you to pray. And we're going to be doing some teaching on it throughout the whole month to help you. I'm asking you to hunger for God, but we'll give you tools so that you, if you get close to the food, you're going to get hungry. And that's what we want to do in these next messages is get you so hungry. It's not going to settle for less. You're going to settle for more. Not going to settle for just what's in front of you. There's so much more, so much more. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't like to close a service. I've talked about the one who brings change, but he's a gentleman. Every eye closed, every head bowed. This change, this 2018 being different cannot happen without him. And he's a gentleman. He will not tamper with your will. That's just how he, does. That's just how he made you. He made you with a free will. He doesn't want to force himself on you. Yet, it's still so amazing that he believed in us and loved us so much, he paid such an awesome price, allowed himself to be so brutally beaten, go to hell, experience hell, just so, just so there'd be an opportunity for humanity to know him, to be one with him, to be family. Yet he will not tamper with the will of man. He says, 
I came to give you life. So this morning, maybe you've been a part of a religion, maybe a part of a church, but the question is, have you known him? Have you asked him into your heart? Have you allowed his spirit to literally come into your human spirit and remake you? It comes with surrender. It comes with a simple prayer. And this morning, I want to lead you in that prayer. If you've never received Jesus, if you've never accepted him into your heart, this is your morning for a miracle. If you want to be included in this prayer, greatest miracle of all, quickly raise your hand. Quickly raise your hand. I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive Jesus. Some of you, you're raising your hand, but I know you're saved, but you want to rededicate your life. You can raise your hand for that too. You want to recommit your life to the Lord. You want to be saved. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand all over this place. I see that hand. I see that hand. Bless you, bless you, bless you. The greatest miracle. Now we're going to pray this prayer. And a supernatural miracle will happen to your soul, to your spirit. The very living God will enter and make all things new. So pray this after me. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I recognize you died such a brutal death for me. You took my sin that I could have a relationship with you. So I ask you, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. Today, I believe I'm born anew. I'm saved. I'm your child. Amen. Let's just give God, give God praise for what he's doing in people's lives. I praise you. I praise you. Such miracles that have happened in this place today. It's so exciting. Now, if you received Jesus this morning, if you've committed your life to him for the first time, maybe you just need to talk to somebody on that connection card that Pastor James talked about. Just pull it out and just mark it. We'll get resources to you. We'll make sure that we'll get in contact with you if you mark your card. We'd love to do that. But something has happened today. I'm going to share one more thing, and I'm sorry, but there was a... Elianette, where's Elianette? She probably went out already to get ready to serve. She was in first service. She, was in, she came in second service, too. She had an open vision, folks. And she saw angels outside of the building. Vision still exists, okay? This is not pizza from the night before. This is a woman, listen, I want to tell you a little bit about Elianette. Elianette, at one time, she worshiped Satan. So she's like one of those major conversion people, okay? She saw angels surrounding this building, and she saw that their wings were so colorful and so strong. And she said, God is so pleased at what you are teaching. And he's so excited because he knows if his people will do what, this, what you're teaching, their lives will be changed. And they're already rejoicing. Restoration doesn't happen on its own. It's intentional. Let's do this together. We're entering 21 days of prayer. It starts next Saturday. Put it in your calendar. We're going to have 6 o'clock in the morning prayer. We're going to be meeting in homes. If you can't do 6 o'clock in the morning, be intentional. Put it in your calendar. Learn, grow, be a part of this. There's so much more that God has for us. Amen.